Good morning. Our opening hymn this morning is number 370, Victory in Jesus. Please rise as you're able and join us. Again, that's number 370 in your hymnal. Good morning. morning. I want to welcome you to worship today. It's uh, wonderful to see uh, all of your bright, smiling faces. Uh, Maybe uh, rainy on the outside, uh, uh, but uh, it is sunny and bright in here as uh, we gather together to worship our risen Lord and Savior. Uh, If you're visiting with us today, I want to say a special welcome to you. Uh, We're glad you're here. We hope you're blessed by your worship experience, and uh, uh, we pray that you'll come and worship with us again very soon. Uh, Also, want to uh, welcome those that are worshiping with us on Facebook Live. Uh, Thankful that you can be a part of this service and uh, remind you to check in with us uh, in the comment section uh, if you have prayer concerns or joys, uh, you can share those in that same place. Uh, I do have a a number of things that uh, I want to mention uh, in the way of announcements today. Uh, One is uh, we are still needing some drivers to help us uh, pick up residents at Clarkston Square Apartments on Sunday morning uh, so that they can come and worship with us uh, in this service. We've had several people uh, who have volunteered to do that, uh, still need a few more. Uh, if you would be willing to do that, if you would let me know, if you would let uh, Paul Weigert, our associate pastor, know, uh, we would appreciate your help in doing that. Uh, also, uh, 
Next Sunday, uh, we are going to be starting uh, a new round of confirmation classes. Uh, we have a, a, a few folks signed up for those. But uh, if you know of someone, a family member, a friend, a neighbor who is around sixth grade in age and uh, would be a prospect for our confirmation classes, uh, please let uh, Christian Sutherland, uh, our youth pastor, know that, or me, or Paul Weigert. Uh, there's still time uh, to be a part of this uh, uh, new round of confirmation classes that, again, begins next Sunday uh, from 3.30 to 4.30 in the youth room. Um, our Dollar Club got kicked off uh, last Sunday, uh, and it got kicked off with a bang. We received over $400 last week uh, going towards uh, our Dollar Club. And I, I want to explain it again because I still think maybe there's some confusion about what the Dollar Club is. Uh, it is an effort that we are starting uh, that will hopefully give us an opportunity to help people in our community here in South Huntsville in more substantial ways uh, than we have been able to in the past. We want to give people a hand up and not just a hand out. Uh, and uh, the way this works is every Sunday in worship, uh, on top of your normal tithes and offerings, I'm asking everybody in worship to give $1 a piece. Uh, and uh, those dollars will be collected over a quarter. Uh, and once a quarter, we'll have a dollar club committee. They'll meet, they'll review applications, and we will give out all of that money that we have received to one person or to a few people uh, to try to help them with things like housing and utilities and uh, education and medical expenses. Uh, again, the idea being a hand up and not just a handout. Uh, if you're giving to this through a check, just make sure you mark on the check that it's for the Dollar Club. Uh, if you're giving cash, any cash that is in the offering plate that's a $10 bill and below will automatically go to the Dollar Club. You don't have to put it in an envelope if it's a $10 bill and below. You don't have to designate it in any way. That's automatically what uh, denominations $10 and below uh, will go to every week uh, uh, for the Dollar Club. If you have any questions about it, uh, please come and see me uh, and ask me after the service. Uh, we have a backpack packing party coming up this Tuesday night here in the main sanctuary uh, at 6 o'clock. Uh, this is packing food and backpacks for uh, kids at Mars Elementary School. Uh, if you'd be willing to help us with that, we would uh, greatly appreciate that. Uh, and also we have a, a Board of Stewards meeting, first one of the year, uh, coming up on Tuesday night, January the 31st uh, at 6 o'clock uh, in the Family Life Center. And we'll be sending out notifications to uh, everyone on the Board of Stewards so uh, uh, you'll be certain that uh, if you're supposed to be there, uh, you can be there. Uh, do you have any announcements that uh, you want to mention today before we pray? Well, I want to mention a couple things in the way of prayer concerns I um, just want to thank you uh, for uh, praying for my dad this week. His surgery on Monday for a uh, torn rotator cuff uh, went well. Uh, his recovery has been pretty tough this week. He's been uh, battling a lot of pain. So uh, I would appreciate if you would uh, continue to pray for him uh, during his recovery. Uh, also, um, please remember uh, Susan Clark and her family. Uh, Susan was uh, back in worship this morning in the early service. She lost uh, her son Greg uh, not long ago. and uh, She shared with us uh, this morning during our prayer time in that service uh, how hard that it continues to be on her and her family. So uh, please continue praying for, uh, for Susan and her family. Uh, do you have any names that you want to lift up this morning before we pray? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Loving God, we praise you for who you are, our creator, our Lord and Savior, and our friend. We thank you that you're a God of transformation, a God of new creation. Lord, I pray that you would help us to trust you with our whole life. Help us to anchor all that we are in your goodness and in your faithfulness and love for us. We're humbled that you love us with an everlasting love. I pray, Lord, that we could love others in the same way that you love us. 
we could be a, a reflection of Christ to this community that we're blessed to live in. Lord, we uh, confess to you that we struggle every day to know your will and to be obedient to it. It's so easy for us to head down the wrong road sometimes and to get sidetracked by this fallen world that we live in. Lord, help us to fix our eyes upon you, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Uphold us and lead us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, as we consider our needs and our problems today, sometimes we forget the needs of others. But as we see all these names on our prayer concern list, and we think about the unspoken names on our hearts today, we pray according to your will that you would be at work in each life and in each situation. And as we worship you today, would you fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit and speak to us in a fresh way. And now, Lord, we join our voices together in praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to invite our ushers to come.
As we remain standing, let's affirm our faith together through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. I come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As you take your seats, go ahead and grab your hymnals and join us for our next hymn, number 474, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Again, that's number 474 in your hymnal. Thanks to Tyler and Eleanor and our choir uh, for uh, the fantastic th job they do every week uh, leading us in worship. Uh, we're blessed to have each and every one of them. Uh, the passage of Scripture that uh, I want to share with you today comes from uh, Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Hear God's Word. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, 
the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I hope that uh, your memory uh, is about as bad as mine is. Uh, I am uh, sort of banking on that today uh, because I'm going to tell you a story that I've told you before. Uh, I I shared this story on Easter Sunday uh, the very first year that I was here, and that's been almost 10 years ago. So uh, that's a long time. Maybe you've forgotten it if you heard it before. Uh, But this story took place uh, the summer after I graduated from high school, Uh, and that was uh, way back in the year 1988. Uh, I was going to be moving to Auburn uh, to start college uh, that uh, following fall. and uh, Let's just say that summer, I I was trying to have all of the fun that I could possibly have uh, before uh, I left uh, and started school. Well, one night, uh, I was out with some uh, good buddies of mine, and uh, we were going to a a social gathering. Uh, If we weren't in church, I would say we were going to a party. Uh, But uh, this uh, house that was uh, hosting uh, this gathering, uh, we got there and got out, and we were making our way to this place, and uh, one of my closest friends was walking right beside me. Uh, And everybody called this guy by his nickname. Uh, And his nickname was Turtle. Uh, And I have to admit to you that at that point in my life, uh, I was also known by my nickname. Uh, Everybody called me Possum. Uh, And uh, don't ask me why that was my nickname because I'm not going to tell you. Uh, But before we got inside this house, we saw these two really pretty girls Uh, standing outside in the garage. Uh, And so uh, we decided to walk over and talk to them. And uh, we tried to act as cool as any two guys called Possum and Turtle could possibly act. Uh, And uh, much to our surprise, when we walked over there and started talking to them, they didn't run off. Um, Well, this uh, chance encounter that we had that night that led to some subsequent phone calls and a first date uh, and many dates that followed after that. Uh, And even though I left to go to Auburn just a few months later, I soon realized that I didn't want to be there. And after one quarter, I moved back home and I started going to a junior college, Sneed State Junior College in Boaz. Uh, And the reason that I did that was because I was head over heels in love with this girl named Amy. Now, that was almost 35 years ago uh, when we first met. We've been married for 27 years. uh, And I have absolutely no idea how she has put up with me uh, uh, for all of this time. Uh, But meeting her on that night so long ago, that altered the direction of my life. It changed everything for me. And whoever said that lightning doesn't strike twice uh, was uh, not there on that night we met. Because my buddy Turtle, uh, that girl that he met, well, he married her too. Uh, And uh, they have four children and uh, they live in Gunnersville today. But you know, every experience that we have in life, it, it shapes us in some way. But there are some experiences, but both good ones and bad ones, that I think have the ability to transform us. Uh, We aren't the same after we go through some of these things. Uh, And that was certainly true for a young man named Saul. Uh, This encounter that Saul has with Jesus uh, as he was traveling along the road, making his way to Damascus. Uh, That changed everything for him. 
But you know, I think it did even more than that. It not only transformed this man from being Saul to being the Apostle Paul, uh, but I also believe that uh, this encounter with Christ transformed the world as we know it. This story uh, about Saul's Damascus Road experience, uh, it was so important that Luke talks about it three different times in the book of Acts. Uh, And even though this is probably a story all of us know well, Uh, I still want us to think some more about it today as we continue in this Acts sermon series. But before we focus, uh, before we think about the encounter between Saul and Christ, uh, I want to uh, give Saul's life a little bit of context. Uh, Saul was originally from a a place called Tarsus. Uh, That place is in modern-day Turkey. Uh, He was born into a a devout Jewish family, uh, a Greek-speaking Jewish family. His family also happened to be Roman citizens. Uh, And when Saul was still young, his parents sent him to Jerusalem uh, to study under a man named Gamaliel. Saul was a highly, highly intelligent man. He was superbly educated in the law and the prophets. What we know is the Old Testament. By Saul's own admission, he was a devout Pharisee. Uh, And not only in terms of the things that he believed, but he was devout in the way he lived, in his actions. Uh, And we got our first glimpse of that in the story that we talked about last Sunday. And that was the story of Stephen being stoned to death. Now, that happened at the hands of the Sanhedrin. And Luke told us that as that was taking place, uh, there was a young man standing there. And all of the coats of those that stoned Stephen were laid at his feet. And that young man's name was Saul. He, he was a witness to Stephen's murder, but he was more than that. Uh, he fully agreed with what they did to Stephen. Now, when Saul was described as someone who was zealous, that that meant that he was more than willing to resort to acts of violence uh, in the pursuit of what he believed in. And he believed that the followers of Jesus were trying to destroy everything that he believed in. Uh, And all of this talk about Jesus being the Messiah, well, Saul believed that that was blasphemy. A crucified Messiah made absolutely no sense to him. That that was completely contrary to everything that he had been taught since he was young. And so, after Stephen was murdered, Saul was the one leading the persecution of those followers, the early church in Jerusalem. He was going house to house and dragging men and women out and having them arrested for being part of the way. He was enemy number one of the early church. He was trying his best to destroy it. And when those believers started to flee Jerusalem uh, in fear of what Saul was doing there, um, Saul didn't give up. He wanted to go after them. And so he went back to the religious leaders and the Sanhedrin gave him the authority to make his way to Damascus and search for Christ followers there and uh, hopefully arrest them and send them back to Jerusalem. Now, that journey from Jerusalem to Damascus uh, was a journey of a, a little less than 150 miles. Saul would have made it on foot. It would have taken him about a week to do that. He was traveling with a a few other men that the Sanhedrin had sent along with him to help him in his efforts. And as they were nearing the city of Damascus, that's when this encounter with Jesus takes place. As Saul was walking along the road, A brilliant light from above shone all around him. And this light was so bright, it was so brilliant, it was even more bright than the sun itself. 
This light was so bright it not only blinded him, but it knocked him to the ground. And as Saul was laying there on the ground, he heard a voice. A voice that was calling him by name. That voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And at first he has no idea whose voice this is. But then Jesus told him who was talking to him. And he instructs Saul to go into the city of Damascus. And uh, when he got there, he would be giving more instructions. And those men who were traveling with Saul, they were shocked as well because they had also heard this voice, but that they hadn't seen anyone. That brilliant light that had surrounded him, uh, it doesn't seem that they were able to see that same light. Now, that's basically the story that Luke tells us about this encounter Saul has with Christ. That that's how it took place. But in order for us to better understand what this story means for us, I think we need to try to get inside Saul's head. We need to think about what really happened to him on that Damascus road that transformed his life. And the first thing that I think we see happening is that Saul was blinded so that he could see. In Christ, God was doing something new. Jesus was the ultimate fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He was the Messiah. But Saul couldn't see that. Everything that he had been taught was at odds with that idea. And when the light of Christ blinded Saul, that glorious light, it wiped away everything that Saul had been taught. This understanding that he had long held about the law and the prophets, that was torn to pieces. And it was put back together in a brand new way. And everything that Paul did from that moment forward was done in response to this encounter that he had with Christ. That experience, it gave him a brand new perspective to see the world with. Now, the truth is, we all have our own unique way of seeing things whether we realize that or not. And all of our life experiences have shaped the way that we see the world around us. And sometimes the way we see things is warped. And it's warped for different reasons. You know, maybe we're like Paul, and we've been taught to see the world in the wrong way. Or maybe life has been hard on us. We've gone through some really difficult times, experienced some painful things, and that's made us bitter, angry, resentful. It's been confusing to us, and that has shaped how we see things. Or maybe it's just our sinful condition. The uh, default setting that we all have to focus on ourselves and our own selfish desires instead of seeing the big picture. Understanding that the world does not revolve around us. Now, I spent uh, a whole lot of my adult life focused and consumed in a pursuit of Success and money and power and privilege. That's how I looked at the world around me for a long, long time. And I needed to be blinded in order to see what was far more important. And whatever it is that gets in the way of us seeing people and seeing the world around us the way that Jesus does. Being blinded to those things can give us a brand new perspective. And I believe it's the light of Christ 
that makes that possible. Now, the second thing uh, I believe we should recognize about this encounter that Saul has with Christ is really all about grace. The grace that Saul experienced in that encounter. He got to experience that God's grace is always enough. Now, Luke doesn't do anything to sugarcoat what an awful guy that Saul was. Again, our first introduction to Saul was him watching Stephen being stoned to death. And as I said to you last week, as we talked about Stephen, Stephen was a very special person. He was highly respected. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom. After he gave his testimony before the Sanhedrin, it said that his face glowed like an angel. He even prayed for forgiveness for those men while they were murdering him. And Saul, on the other hand, he stood there and watched as every last stone was thrown at Stephen. And he was all for it. Now, I can think of a whole lot of words that I could use to describe someone like Saul. And none of those words are good words. None of them are nice words. And we don't know why Jesus chose a man like Saul. But no matter how awful Saul's actions were, no matter what kind of person Saul had been, God's grace was still more than enough to transform his life and to make him into someone completely new. And if Jesus could transform Saul into the apostle Paul, then I believe that he can transform anybody. And if you don't find hope when you're reading Paul's story, I would strongly, strongly encourage you to read it again. Because I believe it is absolutely a story of hope. Now, the last thing that I want us to recognize in this encounter between Saul and Jesus is that Jesus met Saul right where he was. When Saul has this encounter on the Damascus Road, that the transformation that we see was incredible. It was a, a complete and utter metamorphosis. It was night and day. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many people had a hard time believing Paul when he started proclaiming the gospel and living in a very, very different way because this change he had undergone was so drastic. You know, sometimes when we read a, a story like Paul's or when we hear somebody share an amazing testimony, we think, we mistakenly think that all our stories should sound like that. Maybe we wonder why we haven't had our own Damascus Road kind of experience. Well, I'm thankful for all of us that we haven't lived the life that Saul lived. Now, I know that God's grace washed Saul's sins away. I know that through God's grace, Saul was born again and he was made new. But I also have to believe that the memories of some of those awful, awful things that he had done, they must have haunted him sometimes. Even though his sins were forgiven, the impact of his sins, of his actions, how that had affected other people, all of that remained. But Jesus came and he met Saul right where he was. Right in the midst of his brokenness and his sin. And that's where Jesus comes to meet all of us. And no matter where Jesus finds us, he offers us his grace. And he calls us by name because he wants to have a relationship 
with each and every one of us. And that doesn't require a Damascus Road kind of experience for that to become a reality in our life. And so please don't ever believe that if you haven't had that kind of experience, that that somehow means your faith isn't real or that you've missed out on something. I think that's just Satan trying to plant seeds of doubt in our mind. When Saul met Jesus on that road, that changed everything for him. He was blinded so that he could see. No matter how awful his sins were, God's grace was more than enough to transform him and make him into someone new. And Jesus came and he met Paul right there where he was. And he turns his life in a new direction. Now, all of those things were true for Paul. And I hope and pray for us that we would recognize from his story that all of those things are true for us as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, Um, our closing song this morning is going to be a little bit different. Uh, If you guys know the I Saw the Light by Hank Williams, uh, please rise and join me. We're going to sing I Saw the Light. Bow your heads with me. Gracious God, we're so grateful for the light of Jesus Christ. That life that transformed Saul's life on that Damascus road. And that light that is at work in each and every one of our lives. Trying to transform us day by day more fully into the image and the example that Christ has given to us. Lord, help us be the disciples. Help us be the church 
that you created and called us to be. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Last week.